Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome once again to uh, a, uh, a what we hope will be an exciting program for you today. Um, we will uh, first, as we always do, uh, we want to acknowledge the land that we that we sit on right now. So um, I'm going to turn you over to Robbie Madrigal, who is from the library. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and, and thank you, Hakeem, for joining us. Um, I'm going to do the land acknowledgement. Um, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory of the ancestral lands of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have the responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. I'll turn it back to you, Mary. Thank you, Robbie. Appreciate that. Uh, so important. So important. Uh, this is the this is the time in the program where we usually present the good news. Uh, you know, a cop going to jail or something like that. But but unfortunately, we don't have any good news today. And hopefully, we'll have something next week. Uh, but I am not going to delay any further. Uh, we are so honored and so excited to have Akeem Browder with us today. Uh, and if you don't know uh, the name Khalif Browder, uh, you will after today because Khalif is um, Akeem's brother. And so I'll just read a short bio. He is a social justice advocate and agent of change. The Bronx native, uh, works to honor the legacy of his brother, Khalif Browder, and mother, Vanita Browder, by working with elected officials, lawyers, doctors, college students, and community-based organizations to change laws, policies, and regulations that devastate poor communities and families that have been impacted by mass incarceration and solitary confinement in state prisons. He is the founder of Shutdown Rikers and the Khalif Browder Foundation. A civil engineer by trade, he is currently traveling the country promoting the six-part Spike, uh, Spike TV docuseries, Time, the Khalif Browder story. So with that, uh, I want to thank Khalif again. Uh, thankfully, he didn't have to travel all the way from New York. We are seeing him virtually, uh, but, but thank him and, uh, and uh, turn it over to him. Thank you, Khalif. You're on mute. There you go. And it's Akeem. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do that. And you know what I wish it was? I, well, one, thank you for having me. Uh, and for everyone that's uh, tuning in, uh, thank you for giving uh, my family and my family story uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, a lot of people, as I was saying, uh, often do uh, mistake and say Khalif because obviously we're here to talk about something that happened to Khalif Browder, my youngest brother. Um, but <clears throat> I generally speaking, I, I would rather him be here to actually speak to you all uh, in his own words. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, present my brother in the way that uh, a family member would with uh, their loved one. And also, uh, as uh, we did when we presented the time, the, doc, uh, the docuseries called Time, uh, the Khalif Browder story. Uh, this was a six part uh, docuseries that uh, was the first docuseries actually uh, done uh, in uh, and what we did by, uh, and how we did it by presenting Khalif's story. Uh, so <clears throat> I am, again, I'm Akeem Browder. Uh, I am Khalif's, one of Khalif's older brothers. Khalif was our youngest. And uh, in our family dynamic, uh, Khalif uh, being the youngest was also, well, all of us was uh, taken in by a lovely uh, woman, my mother, Vanita Browder, uh, who adopted us. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if everyone can hear me, I'm sure you can, but um, so uh, my mother, Vanita Browder, uh, adopted all of us, and uh, with adoption comes. Uh, a range of different families that my mother has taken in. Uh, I being the first adopted in our family, um, 
who came in at birth, uh, well, nine months old. Uh, and I saw uh, all of my family members uh, that uh, came in after me. Uh, and yet we're all family. So where you do see Kali's face, which uh, I believe that uh, the, um, the background of this uh, would be uh, showing Kali, uh, Kali's face uh, from our website. Uh, it's the KaliDaughterFoundation.com uh, where you would see his face and wonder is that his brother? I've actually gotten that several times. Um, like, where's the connection? <laughs> but uh, to be honest with you, we did not know we were adopted. And what we did know is that we were all family, no matter what skin, complexion, uh, race, color, creed, uh, we came in as family. And since we all came in at birth, we didn't know any difference. So I want to give a big up to my mom, a shout out to my mother who is no longer with us, uh, and I'll get into this. But I do want to like uh, say our, our families are interconnected, no matter how you see it, uh, we are all connected. Uh, and so, <clears throat> I wanted to start off uh, with just a basic of Kali, uh, who uh, at 16 years old experienced something that many people in this state that I live in, uh, currently in the city that I live in as well, New York City, uh, has been uh, in a black and brown community. Uh, the statistic or analytics would be one in every three black people um, find themselves uh, in front of the law um, and uh, or dealing with the legal situation. Uh, that being said, um, Khalif was one of those um, uh, unfortunate people who wrongfully was arrested and sent to Rikers Island. Now, uh, as you can see on the screen, how much does a backpack really cost? Um, this is what we were talking about. How much does a backpack really cost was really a statement as to say what are what our kids go through? Is it really that is it is the cost really uh, worth what happens? Uh, whether it's uh, the mental stars, the physical stars, the permanent lack uh, or uh, permanent uh, loss of life, um, but. What does it really? Uh, what does it really come down to? With Khalif, it, really, it happened to be that Khalif was accused of stealing a backpack, and this is why we asked, how much does a backpack really cost? Uh, because Khalif, uh, to Khalif, it cost him his life. If we can just show the first uh, video, um, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for playing that. Um, now, I, I, I want to get into uh, his story. Now, that what you watched was just a quick timeline. I do want to have uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of this program uh, or the session time to answer questions from everyone uh, and have some uh, back and uh, conversation back and forth. 
Uh, but I do want to introduce Khalif in a more uh, intimate way uh, at this point. So although you saw a timeline, you did probably see or catch that Khalif committed suicide. Uh, I'm going to go into this right now because Khalif deserves, uh, as well as everyone, deserves time to have their story told, especially when uh, you are here yourself to tell your story. Um, the way that we came about doing this story was unfortunately uh, uh, due to Khalif's arrest. My youngest brother, to, before jail, uh, he and I were actually really close. He was uh, my workout partner when we were younger. He uh, at the, I, I'd say at the age of seven, eight years old, he was interested because I would work out in the house. It's not like we had money to go to the gym. We come from the Bronx, New York, uh, where we were too poor to actually uh, afford going to the gym. Um, and realistically, I was young. My, my mother probably wouldn't have just let me just roam go to, the, uh, go to a gym. Um, <clears throat> so we worked out in the house. We'd do like little routine push-ups, pull-ups. Uh, like play fighting, all this stuff. <clears throat> and Khalif, like I said, at the age of like seven years old, he had like more than a six pack. He had like an eight, 10 pack. Like he, he was just such a like healthy, young, strong kid. Um, uh, and it was just like, it, it was just like, it was nothing. It was, it was just expected that, you know, this is my youngest brother. We have, let me just explain to you, my mother took in, uh, seven kids uh, that she adopted. Uh, she uh, adopted seven, but she forced the care 32 kids, and she also had two ch uh, children of her own. Uh, my two oldest brothers, uh, Rahim and Shahan, uh, are her kids that she birthed and decided to take in and adopt, uh, well, to take in 32 kids, but ended up adopting seven of them. So uh, we had a uh, have a huge family, um, especially like with our cousins and our aunts that always and, and uncles that came over. We had a happy family. It wasn't uh, the perfect family, but realistically, uh, I mean, you didn't even we didn't know because it was like almost a fish in the bowl uh, dynamic uh, fish in the in the fish tank uh, scenario. You don't know you're in water until you're taken out. We didn't know we were in poverty. Uh, until we were uh, exposed to uh, the fact that we were in poverty. Like, we knew we couldn't afford everything, but life was still pretty much decent. Like, my mother did what she had to to get us into good schools. So uh, where Khalif uh, went to school as a, as a kid, PS32, um, was where my his older brothers went and my sisters. Um, he had a normal life. He was going to school, uh, just like everyone else. He um actually wasn't doing bad in school he was just a normal kid uh he actually at home he watched things like Yu-Gi-Oh um I don't know if any of you here know of Yu-Gi-Oh um or he just gives a thumb, give it a thumbs up or even uh yes to uh, knowing Yu-Gi-Oh or even Dragon Ball because that was the running theme in our household we all watched and loved Dragon Ball I don't know um, I, I don't know what year it started. It was before I was alive. Uh, before I was alive, my oldest brother was watching Dragon Ball, and then it trickled down to then my next brother, then me, and then everybody, all the way down to Khalif. Khalif actually thought that he was Vegeta, even though I was Vegeta. Um, and you, we used to like battle all the time in the house. So my brother, just like everyone else, was a average, average kid. Uh, and with the likes of everything that everyone else likes and the potential to be just like everyone else, the potential to have, uh, to be whatever you want to be. Um, not only that, I mean, we, we had a mother that uh, really took, sacrificed herself uh, to give us everything. I mean, my mother really, I got to say, she never really paid attention to herself, um, which isn't really helpful. But she did this in sacrifice of her kids, which we are all grateful to. Like, in, I'm sure you all that have someone significant in your life, whether it's your mother, your father, I myself, I'm a single father. Uh, I have full custody of my uh, four-year-old, now four-year-old child. Um, and I've had my son since birth till now. And whether you're a mother or a father, your kids look up to you and uh, look at your example. And that's what we all did at my mom. She showed us love. 
she showed us what family is she cared for us and provided for us and so i think we had a uh decent humane uh childhood uh when it comes to how my mother brought us up now uh society in the bronx though um and new york city uh looks at us in a different way uh you are just the adopted children i've heard that many times or you're an adopted one um we've also i mean i am although you might look at me and say uh you know i've heard people say you're not black though right um actually my heritage uh, even though i'm adopted to a my mother is uh, is cherokee indian and black um so although i'm a light-skinned black um i my heritage actually i'm not my mother because i'm not my mother's heritage i'm uh, adopted to her so my background i'm a jamaican and moroccan man um and yet in the bronx you're just black but to people outside of I'm sorry, there was an interruption. Um, to people outside of uh, like our atmosphere uh, of a black and brown society, um, they're like, but you're not really black though, right? Uh, well, in our society, they consider us black. And when you're black and come from the Bronx, those two dynamics will land you in front of the law. You're poor, and so you're misunderstood. Everything is, we're going to watch you as you go into your stores and uh, as you walk around, you are the more likely one they think to steal or rob them um, or to be doing something illegal or sketchy. Um, Khalif has explained this in our documentary, which I hope you do take, uh, or already have or take, a, uh, take some time to watch our documentary. It's on Netflix at the moment um <clears throat> it's called time again time the Khalif brother uh, story and as Khalif ex explained you know going to school on his way to school uh he would be uh stopped by the police and it was just an average thing that the teachers knew that this was happening so they would just make a conversation like what did you get stopped about today in school um this is really not a good environment uh to really raise your kids um because your interactions just on your way to school can change your whole mood and your mindset uh so khalif had, had experienced this which when he, uh, when he was 16 15 uh going to school um i experienced the same thing on my way to school uh and it, it we just considered that the norm uh, but we didn't realize how much that was imp impacting us until you get older. Now, Khalif, on the other hand, uh, did not see it coming, but on his way to school, you know, or, or actually it was uh, on his way back home from a birthday party, um, Khalif was stopped by the police because uh, an allegation, because of an allegation uh, that said that he had stolen someone's book bag. And the accusation actually came in verbatim said uh, that black guy stole my brother's book bag. And so if you just look at the string of words, that black guy stole my brother's book bag. Um, and so it would actually, it, it would say that like, okay, someone's accusing you, but the way the accusation came in, we live in a black neighborhood. I mean, the neighborhood was black from one end, Hispanic on another. And, but how do you tell in the middle of the night? Because he was coming home from a birthday party, and so it was dark. Uh, and they said that that guy right there stole that black guy stole my brother's book bag. And so, <clears throat> in that accusation, uh, Khalif was then arrested and sent to Rikers Island. I don't know if you've heard of Rikers Island. And for those of you that have heard the name Rikers Island, or even heard of any stories on Rikers, like currently they're going on, um, you would know that it's a horrendous torture chamber. Um, this place actually, uh, what is described of, if you know of the, 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 the location of um, Guantanamo Bay, um, it is its own little Guantanamo Bay. It's an island 
uh, right. It's the property of the Bronx, but it's located in Queens. So it might confuse you if you don't know New York demographics. There's five boroughs in New York, Bronx, Staten Island, Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. That's the city of New York in the state of New York. And so in the city of New York, in the Bronx, uh, Rikers Island is a part of that uh, property, is a part of the, Rik the, the island of Rikers Island is a property of the Bronx, but it's actually located in Queens. And it's so far distant, but so close that you can see it going on your way to work if you live in that area. But it's on an island where there's only one bridge that takes you over. And that bridge, if the guards or the, uh, the, the island uh, staff, like the uh, sergeants, lieutenants, whoever controls the island, if they decide to let the bridge up, then there is no access going in. And they do that often. They display their, their, their authority uh, by making sure there are no media that goes on to Rikers. Uh, sometimes, because uh, I've actually uh, had my own experience in Rikers in many different ways. I actually was a resident meaning I was accused of a crime when I was younger. Uh, and I actually stayed on Rikers myself. Um, and then I ended up, as I got older, uh, I got a bachelor's in civil engineering, and I ended up working for the Department of Corrections as an engineer on Rikers. And it is definitely true on both spectrums um, that Rikers will just open their bridges and not let anyone in or basically close off uh, to the population. And uh, your stories, or the stories then are created. Uh, like if someone was murdered on Rikers, because it's such a horrendous place, uh, you can get hurt. You could be permanently uh, ill. You could be murdered on Rikers, um, on Rikers Island. And yet, if something as far as murder happens, the media should be able to get to Rikers and divulge that story as it is uh, supposed to be, as it is. Uh, however, uh, they control the media by opening, the, making sure the bridges are up, telling, uh, creating their story, and then close the or open the bridges so that the, uh, the media can go on and then get the story told as it was directed or orchestrated to do. It might sound like scandalous, but that is, the, that is the current situation on Rikers. Right now, there's so much drama around Rikers Island. Um, but if I, if I take you back uh, to when Khalif was on Rikers, this was back in 2016. Uh, 2016, Khalif um, uh, on Rikers uh, for three years. Uh, three years on Rikers for allegedly stealing a backpack. Um, how we get three years when the law in the state of New York says for a felony, you are uh, allowed to be held by the state for prosecution um, and trial to be found innocent in, uh, where you're innocent until proven guilty, the law states. But they, in that time uh, of 90 days, if you're arrested for a felony, uh, you are allowed to be held by the state for 90 days. Uh, if you are uh, arrested uh, for in the state of New York, in the city of New York, um, if you are arrested for a misdemeanor, they are allowed to hold you 60 days until they find out whether you whether they can say that you did whatever they um, did or uh, accuse you of. And if you are arrested for a violation, at max, they can hold you for 30 days. Um, these are our constitutional rights in, the, in, in not just America, but in New York's uh, um, uh, constitution. Uh, and the Department of Justice has found ways, obviously, because Khalid was in there for three years. Um, I'm going to stop right here uh, and ask that our very our next video uh, is played because this will help tell the story a little uh, a little more.
you. So injustice, as we created these videos, these are short infographics that you can see uh, on, uh, in, uh, on YouTube. They are called Khalif Browder infographics. Uh, they are different uh, videos that we outlined to help tell Khalif's story uh, if you wanted to learn more direct information about Khalif's case in a short one minute uh, video. Um, or if you want, as, as I said before, you can uh, visit Netflix and check out the uh, Netflix documentary called Time the Khalif Browder Story. Um, as we are talking about uh, uh, the injustice that Khalif or anyone uh, that goes into the department of quote unquote justice, uh, you uh, have to question how can something like this happen? And not only how can it happen, but why could, uh, why would this be allowed to happen? Now, what happens on not just Rikers, because Rikers is just one of many jails. It just so happens that we are in the city of New York and the infamous amount of, uh, the infamous um, or the amount of crime that happens while incarcerated, while innocent until proven guilty because Rice, Rikers is not a prison. Again, Rikers is not a prison. And if you understand what the two words mean, prison and jail, prison, or let's start with jail. Jail is when you are arrested for something that you are accused of doing and prison is when you are found guilty or when you take a plea bargain for a charge that uh you was accused of so two different things prison and jail Khalif was in jail never in prison the three years that he was in jail uh Khalif was by law allowed to be or so he's allowed to be considered innocent but in a place that makes you feel like if I'm not if, I, if I'm not guilty, then man, what am I? Or if I'm not bad, what am I? Because the amount of things that you experience, whether it's uh, introduction to drugs, like how do you get drugs in a jail, um, or introduction to death, I, I, uh, I'm, death is the ultimate, but into weapons um, because there are guns that have been found on Rikers. There's uh, blades that found on Rikers, and there's other weapons like tasers that somehow somehow gets to be in, in, uh, in the detainee's hands. Also, don't let the words trick you because Khalif was never an inmate. Although, although, although they would tell you that this is an inmate, um, but if you're innocent until proven guilty, the definition of an inmate is someone that is sentenced and found guilty of a crime. Um, but a detainee is someone who is held until further investigation or pending investigation is uh, in, in, uh, found out. And so Khalif was in detain a detainee. He was an innocent person suffering the atrocities that happened on Rikers, like the endless amount of times he went to court. Back and forth to court, this judge or uh, three, uh, three judges actually seeing this young kid grow before their eyes from a 16 year old all the way to 20. Um, uh, or even uh, the many times that he went to court with a black eye or uh, Khalif was shrinking in, in, uh, in stature because they weren't feeding him. Actually, they put him in solitary confinement for two of those years. Two years in solitary confinement, which I'm gonna explain what solitary confinement is, but I actually wanna uh, let you see this first. So if we can play that last video, it should be a video called Alone. Can we try to get the video? Oh, thank you.
Thank you for playing this. Now, as I said, these are short infographics and, uh, you know, they're, they're only one minute videos. Uh, I would love to hear your questions. I really want to get to it next. Uh, and so I'm going to keep this, uh, this a little short. Uh, when Khalif was in jail for those three years, he uh, suffered two of those years, as I said, in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, as they showed, as we just uh, did this video, is a six by nine uh, cinder block cell. It gets very cold in the winter time. There are no heaters in your cell. Uh, you are only given one bed in your cell, a toilet with a, an attached sink to it. So when you're washing up, you are washing up in front of your toilet. Um, there is sometimes a window in your cell, not always. Um, and then on top of that, you are allowed, as they say by stipulations, one hour. Um, when Khalif was in jail, he was only allowed one hour of recreation a day, meaning 23 hours locked up in this cell and one hour out for recreation. However, that does not mean it was always granted to him. There are times like spans of time, months of times where you are not allowed out because if it's snowing, if it's inclement weather and the guards don't want to stand outside. But if you are given that one hour time, it's not technically one hour. First, they have, they would say it's from 11 to 12 o'clock. Say, so let's say that's the hour. Well, they have to gather all the people between that time. So they will not get them uh, an hour before to get them ready. No, they'll open up the cells, see who wants to go, line you up, and then walk you outside. And you have to make several stops and get searched, pat searched to make sure, they say, to make sure you don't have any weapons on you. Um, and when you go out in that uh, in that area, you know, it takes a lot because you have to, the solitary confinement cells, when you go into uh, the, the recreation yard, it is not with the general population. You have a small cell, uh, area, gated area, that one person at a time is in. And so they'll have to then go through their keys and then put you in, lock the door, then tell you to move away, and then they'll take off the handcuffs. All of this time really allows you half hour, a half hour. And don't be the last person in the line because your time, as we put one person in one cell, another person in another cell, your time has been diminished to, if you're the last person, well, it's from 11 to 12 o'clock and they'll blame you and they'll tell you that, hey, you should have moved faster or you should have got ready faster. You know, you only got one hour. It's, a, it's really torture to be in these kind of situations because also imagine yourself when it comes time for feeding. Yeah, they call it feeding. You're not going to lunch. It's chow time in their words, um, but they uh, they mark it as feeding, as though they're as though you're an animal. Because what do they do when they cage animals in the zoos? They have a feeding time of whatever time it is. These are all animal-like terms. And so when you have a child or a person, a human being, an adult or youth or young adult in these set, uh, settings, they will then display some manic or violent behavior uh, for being caged in a cell in a, in, or for being locked in a cage and then treated like animals, let alone sometimes like Khalif uh, displayed, he was not getting meals. Actually, they would stop feeding him for four meals, uh, four, four meals uh, every time. So that would be breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast. Then lunchtime comes and then as he displayed or told us, which we ended up finding the videos, which you'll see on the documentary, they would give him just a tray of cabbage and a carton of milk. This is not humane. And yet, our mayor in the state of New York, who's no longer the mayor, um, because he was just uh, not, he wasn't reelected, his he term ended. Um, he lied and said he would shut down Rikers. Rikers is not shut down. In fact, it's thriving. Um, and you could find their stock on the open stock market. Because yes, people do invest in jails. And so, they used to go by the name Corrections Corporations of America. Now they go by the name of um, uh, Core Civic. Core, C-O-R-E, uh, Civic. Um, and so, uh, they're a th thriving company, organization that uh, is, they tell you that these are uh, city jails, but and that they're funded by the city. That does not mean they are 100% funded by the city. It just means that they're funded by the city. So the government is not lying that they are funded by the city, but do you know how much in your state 
in your city, in your town, that jail is funded by the city. Well, you have to go into the analytics. But I can tell you from Rikers Island, Rikers Island only gets 30% from the city. The rest is from shareholders. And so I'm going to stop at this point just so I can actually get to the public, uh, to the to your questions, comments, if you have any concerns. If you watch the documentary, I want to say from my family to yours, we are grateful that you took time to hear Khalid's story. Khalid actually said uh, in his own words, when we would film him in Manhattan, downtown or wherever we filmed him, I would drive back home and Khalid's sitting in my passenger seat or in the back seat and my mom's in the passenger seat. And, you know, we just had this, uh, great session where he, he got to express himself and he would reflect on it on the car ride and he would say he would lean up in the front if he was sitting in the back he would have his hand on my seat the driver's seat and the passenger and he would lean up and he'd be like yo I can't he'd something he'd just be like yo bro you think you think anybody's gonna care to even hear this like, and he would ask this consistently because for three years no one cared except for our family but we couldn't even get him out but no one cared to get him or to hear him when he said, I didn't do this. Now, how many of us know of someone that didn't do this, meaning did not do what they said they have, uh, where they were accused of, and yet still had to sit in a place like like this? I turn it over to y'all and I hope to hear uh, what you have to uh, share with us. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Akeem. I promise not to call you Khalif anymore, but I don't think you you are too uh, insulted when I do that. Uh, I apologize. Um, I, I did. Uh, um, uh, Stan is going to uh, sort of field the questions, and it looks like we have about four four now. But there were there was one thing I wanted you to sort of expound on, and that is what Khalif's life was like after he left Rikers. Because I remember him being a little bit of a celebrity, wasn't he? I mean, people were telling his stories, uh, his story on um, CBS Sunday Morning and and shows like that. So I I always felt like <clears throat> all that attention, because he always seemed so shy. But all that attention would save him because, you know, people were paying attention now. He was going to sue the city. You know, there was all this stuff going on. So, I mean, I'm sure it was as more of a shock to you than it was to the public. But, you know, the public was shocked when, when we heard about his story. So can you tell a little bit about his mental health and, and his experience after he left? Mary, yes, thank you for touching on this. And, and while, while I wanted uh, these questions to come in uh, so that uh, we can gauge one, or I typically want to gauge if, uh, if that comes up because uh, who Khalif was after is typically the only thing people ever hear. Yes. And I really wanted to embellish on who he was before um, just so that people could understand and relate. Like, hey, I, I remember when I watched Dragon Dragon Ball, or uh, but when Khalif came home, this is when we saw the complete degradation of who Khalif was, was uh, as to who Khalif is or uh, was when he came out, or uh, yeah, when he came out. Now Khalif still was himself. He was still a very shy child or young young adult at this point. Um, uh, he was also very humble. He was very intelligent. Khalif actually, when we came to visit him, like I came to visit him several times. Um, or by myself, uh, and most of the time to visit my mother uh, so that I didn't take a visit from her. But Khalif would ask for specific books to read and I would feed him certain books. And I'm like, wow, how do you learn about this book? Like one of the books were uh, 48 Laws of Power, um, A Pale dark, uh, pale White Horse. Uh, he loved government conspiracy books, but it was because of the realm that he was in. I mean, Khalif's first time, I'm gonna show you uh, through example, what Khalif actually uh, immensely went through by this example. Uh, one of many examples is Khalif on our, or one of my first visits or probably second visit uh, after he was in Rikers, uh, he, uh, my mother had to go to the bathroom. She wanted to go to the bathroom. I know she was trying to hold back tears and 
So she didn't want to cry in front of him. So she would say she had to go to the bathroom and it was perfect because then I get to talk to brother to brother. Um, and so he was like, yo, bro. And he's, looking, he's like, I, I don't get it. He's like, he said, I don't get it. Most of the problems that happen in here is because of the guards. I thought, I thought the police are supposed to protect you. But in here, they're the ones that's actually causing the problems. You should see how they're setting people up. Like, I know, I know they do. I worked there and I was also a detainee there. And they would set people up. Like, but a crip, a person that's a crip and gang affiliated uh, in a blood house. Like, you know that person's gonna get killed or hurt severely, but they would do it. And it might've been just for entertainment. It might've been because they wanted to make an example, but this is what Khalif was watching. And so another example, Khalif came uh, when, we, when I visit him, visited him uh, in, uh, while he was in solitary confinement, his weight was severely low. And I was scared and I was mad. I was really mad that my, my youngest brother is not being fed. And so again, my mother's in the bathroom or she took a break. And I'm there like, yo, yo bro, why are you not eating? Why do you look like this? And he's like, they're not feeding me. And, but when they do, look at this. He said, but when they do give me food, I don't eat the bread. Uh, Cause I don't, I, I, he, he was trying to, I guess, preserve his stature. Cause he, he knew himself to be strong and muscular. And so he was like, I just eat the cabbage and I drink the bread. I, I, I drink the milk, but I don't eat the bread. I don't want that many carbs. And I'm like, no, bro. Like, I, and I can't logic with him because, so I had to like fake logic and say like, oh yeah, you know what? That's good, bro. But look, look, I need you to eat everything. Like, and he's like, yeah, but that's when they feed. Sometimes I got to save it. So he would say, he would take his milk and put it in the toilet because the toilet water is cool. So the carton of milk, he will put it in the toilet so it can preserve it longer so he can have something to drink. This is ridiculous that my, that my brother or any human being has to live this way. But when Khalif came home, the problems that he had were not that he was aggressive towards people or no, he was fearful, which then sometimes presents itself as aggression. He was fearful that they would take him back to jail. So every time I turned around, he's, he's worried if, some, if a cop, if he heard the sirens, like I'm sure you just heard in the background, um, the sirens would make him fear. So he would lock himself in his room literally for seven days. And then when he came, when he did come out, because no one locked him in his room, my mother would tell him like, or call me and be like, go upstairs, go, uh, go, come to the house and talk, because I was living with my mom at the time. Uh, she was like, come to the house and come talk to him or take him somewhere because he's still in the room and he hasn't come out. But his mentality also was still positive in a way that said, Kelly wouldn't allow it to mess up his brain because his mentality is, I, lost out in school so when i came home, come home i gotta get back so khalif decided to take as soon as he came home his ged and on the first try khalif passed not only passed he then went into college and that was bronx community college and he kept a 3.8 gpa but khalif's integrity was there and this is why when we saw in the videos that he was on oprah he was on um, what the Goldberg show, the view, he was uh, around people like celebrities like Jay Z. Actually, even Khalid, when Jay Z came up, uh, got up to be a part of uh, the family, he literally let Khalid live with him for a month and he kept him in his house. And we would come visit him. And I mean, I, I, I wanted Khalid to like feel like, uh, you know, he, he's special. And so he, we, we set up these interviews where he was on Mark Lamont's show. Um, and Everyone was giving him attention, but it was all too late. Sorry for this long explanation. No, thank you, Akeem. That, that's that's great. And and the, the question I have, and I think a lot of people have, is how did how did 90 days turn into three years? What was the the thing steps that took place to keep him in longer and then longer and then longer? So actually, I'm sure it happens in your state as well. Uh, however, in the state of New York, in the city of New York, um, the city, uh, so when you're incarcerated, when, when you're locked up, the first thing that happens, you have to be arraigned. 
uh, and given your formal charges. Once, once arraignment happens, there is a time clock that's initiated. And this is every state that has a, uh, a span of time that says, okay, we are constitutionally allowed to hold you if it's a felony, 90 days. Now, how do you get 90 days into three years? The way you do it is after arraignment, they will then schedule. So you can have your arraignment and then you are then going to go to your grand jury uh, or, or a hearing or to be indicted or not. Or, and so there's a time span that happens from that day of arraignment to uh, uh, the next day, which you go to court, which would be your grand jury here. Um, and in that year, in that time span, say that's seven days, well, you're counting your days and you're like, okay, I got seven days. Then you're indicted. Let's say you're indicted. And the next court date is scheduled 30, 60 days. So you're like, oh shoot, I got seven days plus 60 days. That's 67 days. This is a felony. I got 90 days. I'm only, they, they, I'm, good. I'm sure I'm gonna get out, but because right, they're gonna see it wasn't me, but when I come back to court, I'm thinking I got 67 days if it's 60 day wait. Now, most of the times it's 30 days, but what happens is you leave court, you go back to Rikers. Your attorney takes on another case. The district attorney plays this game with the time clock. It's called, uh, so the, the time clock uh, is the time that it starts to the time that the court, the, the uh, state says, or the city says you're allowed to hold the person. The time clock is stopped because the district attorney, even though he or she stated that they need 30 days or 60 days to come back and they just have to find the officer or get the witness statement or find the ballistics or get the DNA, all this stuff. Well, what happens is they come back the very next day and we've tracked this. This isn't just me talking. We've actually tracked this to start to watch when these dates were then adjourned following after the first arraignment, uh, after the first year. So they'll say for 30 days, but what happens, they come back at most three days later and then put a petition in and say, we're ready. We found the witness or we found, or the officer is ready. But the next court date is 60 days later. So they stop the clock because if it's not stopped by the district attorney, if it's stopped by your attorney, the defense attorney, the clock, the clock uh, doesn't count. But if, uh, if it's stopped by the district attorney, uh, the district attorney says, we're ready, then the clock stops because they're ready. We're just waiting for the court to be ready, they say, or the defendant to be ready. That's not on us. That's not on what they say on the city. Now, they stop the clock three days. So you only got three days out of that 60-day wait. And then you go back to court and they were like, okay, we saw that there was a petition put in for the district attorney's office saying you're ready. And now all of a sudden, you're not ready. Your witness fled town or uh, your witness is on vacation or uh, there's something happened with paperwork. So then they schedule it again for 30 days, 60 days. They say, oh, we don't have this date on the calendar or there's a holiday coming up or whatever date. And your attorney, your defense counsel is supposed to advocate for a quicker date. But they are dealing with not just your case. They have 40, 100 cases on their desk. And they're like, oh, I can't do it this day, this day. I, but I do have, and then they agree on a date. It's 60 days later. And then when they say that they can, and they can come back because the district attorney says that they're not ready. They're not ready is the key words. So the time could continue. So when they came back at that 60 point, uh, 60, um, that 60 day visit, uh, after the 60 day visit, the judge is like, are you ready? What's going on with this case? And they're like, oh, we're not ready, we're still looking for the witness, or we're looking for the, uh, the officers on vacation. And they say they're not going to be back until 30 days. All right, schedule it for the 31st day. So they play that game again. The date is set. They come back two, three days later and say, we're ready. So you only got three days out of that process. This is how we can get, or the state can get you, or the city can get you, your three years or more. Because they play with the time clock. So your, what it's called is trial readiness or a speedy trial. In your state, I don't know if it would be speedy trial, but you have to get the speedy trial laws changed so that it's what we did in New York. I fought for this, we advocated for it, and we got a bill passed uh, that changed the speedy trial uh, laws in the state of New York to say that it, they only have 
for this amount of time. And the only way they can extend past that time is if they prove, not that they could just say that the district attorney, uh, the officer is out of, because none of that would matter. It would have to be, well, we have, we're waiting for DNA. Because DNA does take time, they say, to come back. Or ballistics, because that's specialist. But anything other than that, they should not have the, and they will play those games. They will put in the petition. However, when they come back to court the next time, say after that 30 or 60 day wait, the judge has, or your attorney has to say, this is against our uh, speedy trial. The law was just passed, 2019 it was passed. Um, and they have to fight for you. And every attorney may do it different, but uh, this is what we're, what we've set motion in the state of New York. Wow, that's, that's a, a, incredible. And I, and I have a bunch of personal questions, but I'm going to get to some of these questions. Um, one of them was, uh, let's see, um, he admitted it. The question I just asked you was his first question, but he said, amending my previous question, do you think if the jail was less privately run, they would be uh, community, less associates? I think what they're trying to say is, if it was ran by the, is it state ran or private ran, the, the, the jail? Is the jail state or private? So, so jails are uh, state run, but with public funding to a certain amount. And yet that does not make or break the, the scenario. So the, when it says it's state run, it's us, it's our, our, our uh, state taxes that's running the jail. Uh, however, um, I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't make your process slower or faster. It doesn't make your process, your time in jail uh, uh, quicker or more expedited um, or not. Uh, and it also doesn't mean that this, um, that the, because uh, I don't want to advocate for private um, jails because then that would also say that there's an interest in keeping these beds filled. Like in Rikers Island, there is a contract that was just renewed in 2020 that the beds have to be filled at 80% capacity. And if not, the city can be sued. The city of New York can be sued for each bed that is not filled. And so they were just facing this in 2019 because we had uh, my organization along with like 20 different organizations, probably even some in, uh, in California funded because we had a, a still had the momentum for Khalif. It wasn't 2019, I'm sorry, it was 2017. Uh, the momentum uh, about what happened with Khalif, we had started a bailout fund. And we approached every celebrity that I knew and other people knew and asked for, we raised about $160 million and started bailing people out. The beds were, we started with women and children first because we knew that was what uh, celebrities is gonna wanna, for some reason they don't consider men saying, uh, get men out of jail. They don't really care about men, but our jails are mostly men in jail. Um, however, we approached it as, because we saw it wasn't working when we said, let's bail people out. Uh, so we approached it as we want to bail out women and children that are nonviolent uh, 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 offenders or accused of nonviolent crimes. And so people got behind that idea, like, yeah, you shouldn't be in jail for a nonviolent crime, especially like Rikers Island. And then we would teach them about what happens to Rikers and so they would come on board. Um, but we started bailing out too many people. The city, before we could even bail out anymore, shut us down. And they didn't tell us we had to stop because it's, it's not illegal what we were doing. What they did was they started getting news reporters to tell stories from like white women in Long Island that was like, oh my God, they're letting, and what they would do is tell them, hey, you know, what do you think about the Khalif Better Foundation and organizations like, uh, like such um, that are bailing out your offender? We didn't bail out her offender. And so what she would, uh, what the woman the, or the, old, the elderly people would do is, oh my God, this is scary. And that person is gonna come and come after me and my husband. He's, that black guy is the one that bashed my husband over the head. Well, if he bashed someone over the head, the, guard, the, the person filling on this woman's mind up wasn't telling her that we're letting out non-violent offenders. If he bashed someone's head, he wouldn't be coming out. But they successfully got over on us, or got over or on the program that we started. So we had to shut that down and then approach it in a different way. And that was through the bills. Now that we know that they're gonna shut us down 
by using the media against us because all that news reports, we started getting threatening letters. We started getting phone calls that was threatening us that you're letting criminals out on the street. What, or what would Khalif think? Oh my God. <laughs> Khalif was accused of... No, ahead, no, Ka Ka I just wanted to clarify. Khalif's solitary confinement was due to the uh, attempted suicide. No, 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 no. Oh, no. wow. Then explain. No, Khalif was put in solitary confinement. For the first time he was put in solitary confinement, it was because the judge, in, on his case, was threatening him and told him that if he doesn't take this uh, take the plea bargain, that he would suffer the consequences it's in the minutes, meaning the minutes are what's written in, in the court language. In the court, there's a stenographer that writes everything, and it's called the minutes. And when we requested, we did a FOIL, which is a FOIL request, Freedom of Information Law. And when we got this, when Khalid came home, it was in the minutes from the judge. If you do not take this plea bargain, you would suffer the consequence. And she then sent word, I'm sure, because how else is this going to happen? That when he went back to Rikers, they put him in solitary confinement. And then every time he came out, he would then get in a fight. They would put him in a blood house. What do you think is going to happen? He's not even a gang. He's not even gang affiliated. And they did it to me, so I know they would do it to him. They put him in a, a cell house five lower in OBCC, which is a, a, a jail, one of the housing units on Rikers. I was there, and when I was a kid, that was a blood house then. It's still a blood house now. And if you're not blood, they don't want you in that house. So they beat you up as soon as you come in. And then they have to take you out and put you back in solitary confinement. And they say it's because it's for your own safety. So now at the end of at the end of all this, Khalif never went to never went to never was found guilty. At the end of all of it, no, Khalif was never found guilty. Actually, they dropped all charges. They said we got the wrong person. Of course, you got the wrong person because the person that actually we found, Jay Z, like um, did a Help, did help us financially to find the person that actually accused or that was that had the book bag originally stolen. And so in our la in the second to last episode, episode five, we found him in Mexico. We actually took a flight, found the brother that was that actually had the backpack stolen, and he said that couldn't have been him in his own words. Not convinced, not nothing. That wasn't him. No, that wasn't him. You should have heard how he was talking. He literally was like confused, like. No, that wasn't the guy. They All they had to do was find him. We're not even detectives, and we weren't paid by the state to do a job to find if this kid is innocent or guilty. We are just family trying to do it on our own after the fact. This is after. I didn't have money to like fly around the state and find this guy or do investigations. No. But when Jay-Z came in and he gave us the, the money to like do this documentary and to get, uh, get witnesses uh, to, to testify, or to like speak on camera. Yeah, you're right, we found them. Uh, can I can I just um, jump in uh, after that statement, Akeem? Um, I think just a, a general statement, we've been doing these programs now for almost two years after the murder of George Floyd. And, uh, and what we hear every week is just unbelievable suffering you know, uh, whether it's out on the street um, and, and, you know, and we're, we're more kind of open to when we see it, when we see it on camera, right? But we as a society need to come to the realization that, that in our name, there is unbelievable suffering going on all over our country. In these places, in California, they put prisons as far away from communities as possible so that grandmas and, and children have a difficult time getting to, pris getting to prison to visit their loved ones. But, but we as a society are going to have to make up our minds that we're not going to have this anymore. You know, whether it's, you know, getting in uh, a, an organization like yours, Akeem, or someone else, but we have all got to do this together. Uh, you know, even the, the ladies on Long Island and Staten Island, you know, they need to they need to understand that this suffering is going on in our names. 
And so uh, I, I, I listened to a podcast with an old geezer uh, talking about a crime from the 20th, the early 20th century. And he always says, and if you have a chance, put uh, drop a drop a nickel in the in the tip jar. And so I am asking our audience today to drop a drop a nickel in the tip jar for the uh, the Khalif Browder Foundation. Uh, and you know we have the information available. Uh, but this is how you know. Unfortunately, it takes money to do what you are doing, Akeem. You know you you had Jay Z on your side. Most jails and prisons don't have somebody like Jay-Z, but we hope that uh, that Khalif's story will will let us know that this is not so unusual, that, that we, have, uh, we have these things going on all over the country. So um, I, I just want to thank you. I know we have a few more questions. We have about 10 more minutes if you can hang on. And I also wanted to thank you for, for providing us that background noise to give us a taste of what New York is really like. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's been great to hear to hear the the horns and the you know you guys like horns in New York. <laughs> we don't do horns in California. Oh you get my shot. god! I know. I, <laughs> I, I, I actually know. I've been to California many times. Um, yeah, yeah. No, unfortunately, I, I and I, I got to say uh, thank you again uh, for everyone that uh, that's watching. I unfortunately I do I have to pick up my son. I'm a single father. I have to pick up my son. Or else I'm going to get in trouble. Understood. <laughs> um, understood. And yeah. so um, I will have to ask that either one uh, that whatever questions, uh, if you, uh, if your audience uh, can write to the Kali Brother Foundation, uh, there is the website, the www.kalibratterfoundation.com. Uh, you can uh, leave messages in our inbox. You can write to us at a, at our Gmail account if you can provide. But uh, we would definitely get back to them, uh, <laughs> and also. Um, you know, it is important to understand that as a foundation, the work that we're doing, we are not funded by the government. We are not a profit organization. We go into schools. Actually, I didn't get to speak about the Kali Brother Foundation and the work that we do, but just know that we are, we work in three phases, advocacy, and that's court, uh, court support advocacy. Uh, we go into the schools and teach social emotional learning, and we also participate in uh, lo uh, lobby, lobbying education. Uh, so we, we do know that uh, through advocacy, there's many ways to advocate. It's not just going on the streets and protesting, because you know what, I've done that for years. I saw the, um, the, the benefits and uh, the ramifications that come with it. Uh, and, you know, some, the government learns from everything we do, and then they work twice as fast because they have the money, the staff, and the funding to work faster. And so they know, okay, we've been dealing with, we're not going to treat this the same way we're gonna we're gonna be one step ahead of you so we have to be one step ahead so now we work to change the minds of the people like yourselves and people that's on here uh to change the minds of the people and give them the real information if you need uh including statistics and analytics or even just real stories which the Kali Brother Foundation does in our school program we have a school program that we teach to youth and young adults between the ages of 13 and 24. Uh, we teach a civic engagement program in that civic engagement program, we actually do a court advocacy court trip where we bring our youth to the courts. Now they usually are the ones, the subjects in the court. At this point, at least they're going without having to have a court case. And we bring them, we sit in the audience of the court and we listen into court, uh, court cases after we've already taught them court terminology so that they can know what's going on. And it, it works on two ends. The person that is used, that, that's going before the judge when, when you have an audience, somehow the judge and the district attorney starts operating officially, like the right way, because they know they have somebody watching them and they don't know who it is. So they act that they act on their best behavior or they talk very low so that you don't hear them and they hide a lot of stuff. But on the other end, on a three pronged way, it's some of the people that's actually going to court have already called the Kali Brother Foundation, meaning their mothers, their daughters, their loved ones. Someone calls the Kali Brother Foundation and says, my son, husband, boyfriend, typically a male, is in Rikers. He has a court date on this date. Uh, can you see if you can help him? Blah, blah, blah. We go through, a, we go through this whole scenario of them telling us what happened. Um, long story short, we need that support because since we're, this is all our work that we do, advocating for other people who need help, and I remember when my mother was the one that needed the help, 
and you have someone that's very powerful in our uh, in the state of California who's a New Yorker, uh, Carmen Perez. Um, I don't know if you know her name, but she was uh, one of the three women that started the women's movement. Uh, she is actually my sister, uh, and so Carmen Perez uh, is now in California. She advocates and she does a lot of work for criminal justice reform out in California. Um, but I mean, talking about this is basically saying this is intellectual work. We are going intellectual and emotional work, and we're going to you. And so we do need the funding that helps us continue doing this. And if there's a way that uh, there could be a coalesce, a coalesce, coalesce uh, fundraising uh, to help us, that's even great, uh, more grateful. Or if you want to help us personally, that would be great if you want to volunteer. Thank you, Akeem. I'm, I'm want, I'm before, have you go, to, before you go, I just want to say thank you for honoring your brother and your mother. Because what you're doing is you're making something very hidden, very public. And that's what needs to happen. People need to know what's going on because most people aren't in the system and don't know what's going on. So I just want to say thank you for doing what you're doing and, uh, and keep up the fight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Akeem. We'll talk soon. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. I hope to have this on this talk again with you all. Soon. Uh, take care Thank of your you. time. And let's talk one. about graduate school. Oh, yes. I'm happy to help. Happy to help. I hope so. <laughs> if you were going into history, I wouldn't. But if since you're going into sociology, I will definitely help. <laughs> take care. Take care. And be Thank safe. you, everybody. Thank you. Be safe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for coming today.